Although the planet Saturn has been known since antiquity, its rings were not first glimpsed until Galileo trained his telescope toward the planet. Galileo quickly understood there was something different about Saturn. It had ears, these lobes that appeared on either side of the planet. He didn't know exactly what they were. He suspected perhaps these could be a pair of moons that just happened to orbit on both sides of Saturn. But as his telescopes improved, his opinion of the objects surrounding Saturn changed. He thought perhaps these were handles of some sort. So maybe Saturn was kind of like a double-handled jug of some type. In 1655, Christian Huygens in the Dutch Republic suggested that perhaps Saturn was encircled by a thin, flat ring. In 1675, Giovanni Dominicio Cassini noticed dark lanes in Saturn's ring, and he proposed that the ring may be split into two, or perhaps as many as three individual rings. Today, we know that Saturn is composed of not one or three, but rather thousands of ringlets, and the rings themselves are not even continuous solid structures, but rather they're composed of billions of tiny particles or moonlets, and they range in size from grains of sand all the way up to giant boulders. But while Saturn's rings are wide and expansive and extremely broad, the rings themselves are remarkably thin. Uh, this dark lane going through the center of the image are the rings. And to give you some sense of scale, if Saturn were a basketball, a sheet of paper seen edge on would be 1,000 times too thick. So think about that. The rings themselves are very thin, which means that they're composed of very small particles. So if you are a ring particle, you may encounter an occasional dense patch, but you may also fall inside of one of these gaps. If we look close at the rings, you'll notice that there are regions where they are very closely bunched together, and then there are regions where they're relatively more spread far apart. And as a matter of fact, even the gaps themselves are really not that empty. Uh, there are just tinier and thinner rings. So the brightness of the rings is really an indication of how much material are crammed into a certain region. Otherwise, the rings appear dark. Now, when we think of Saturn's rings, obviously these very nice, well-defined edges are the things we see in our photographs. However, Saturn is also surrounded by uh, much more diffuse rings. They lack well-defined edges, and they're a lot fainter. So these are going to be something that you're typically are going to find farther out uh, from the planet. And such a diffuse ring was discovered in 2009. Uh, this is uh, an infrared image that you see on the inset. This was made by the Spitzer Space Telescope. So Spitzer is an infrared telescope, and these diffuse rings can glow very dimly in the infrared. So the rings themselves raise several questions, not the least of which were, how did these rings come to be? In other words, where do they come from? And why are the rings still here? Well, the first question is addressed by a kind of a tidal danger zone for large moons. This zone is called the Roche Limit, and it works like this. If we let this moon get a little bit closer, you notice that the tidal forces start to increase. Once it crosses into the Roche Limit, the tidal forces start to overtake the moon's own self-gravity. So the moon begins to disintegrate. And as the moon disintegrates, pieces that are closer to the planet begin to fall into an orbit around the planet. And because of Kepler's laws, we know that objects that are closer to the planet are going to orbit faster than objects that are farther away. So these objects are going to break up into their own individual particles. And the red particles that are closer are going to orbit a little bit faster, while the particles that are farther away in blue are going to orbit a little bit slower. So the origin of Saturn's rings basically comes down to two main theories. Uh, the first is that the rings themselves are the aftermath of a small moon or a comet or maybe multiple moons or multiple comets that all fell within the Roche limit. Or it's simply just leftover debris from when Saturn formed and they could never overcome the tremendous tidal forces to pull themselves into a moon. It's still not clear which of these two ideas is, is in fact correct, but 
These rings are remarkably stable regardless of their origin. But why are they stable? After all, uh, there's a couple of things working against the rings. First of all, sunlight itself. Uh, these are water ice particles, and we would expect the sunlight to uh, burn them off. Uh, sunlight should photo dissociate the ring particles. The second issue is that the rings should break apart by mutual gravity colliding into one another and either spiraling away from the planet or falling into the planet. So something is keeping this ring system stable, and the answer, of course, is gravity, specifically gravity from Saturn's moons. And the moons are employing a couple of different mechanisms to keep things nice and tidy. Uh, the first is, are what's called orbital resonances. The second are shepherd moons. And the third is something that I'm just going to call replenishment for the purposes of discussion here. So let's take these one at a time and talk first about orbital resonances. We learned about orbital resonances when we were talking about Jupiter and its moons. And in this case, I'm going to have a particle that is kind of on the inside edge of the Cassini division. And just beyond the ring system is the moon Mimas. So if a ring particle is just on the inner edge of the Cassini division, it's going to find itself in a two to one resonance. That means for every two orbits that the ring particle makes, Mimas completes one orbit. And this allows this particle to experience a regular gravitational tug in the same direction every other orbit. So over time, that particle, which began at the inner edge of the Cassini division, slowly migrates to the outer edge of the Cassini division. Once it gets beyond this distance, it's no longer in resonance with Mimas, and therefore the ring particle now just orbits freely around Saturn. It is now part of this outer ring. A second method is the shepherd moon method. Uh, so Daphnis is a moon that is tiny enough to fit within the Roche limit. Remember, the Roche limit is based on the tidal forces, and the tidal forces are based on the difference in the gravitational pull between the near side and the far side of a moon. What if a moon is really tiny and the near side and the far side are pretty close together? Well, the tidal forces aren't that strong and the moon can hold itself together. So Daphnis is massive enough to just fit inside the Roche limit without any tidal disruption and yet exert just enough gravity to maintain gaps in the rings and keep these nice edges clearly well-defined. But let's talk briefly about how a shepherd moon can work. If you have a shepherd moon moving about its way inside of a gap, and there's, a, say, a particle behind the moon, it's going to feel a gravitational pull toward that moon, which means that the particle is now going to feel an acceleration, which is going to move it outward. It's going to send that particle flying into the outer ring. Likewise, if you have a moon that kind of wanders out in front of the shepherd moon, it feels a gravitational pull toward that moon and is therefore going to be accelerated downward toward the inner ring. So this is how uh, shepherd moons like Prometheus and perhaps Pandora, but we think it's mostly Prometheus, maintaining Saturn's F ring. And you notice that these little waves or ripples inside the ring, and what's causing that are little tiny particles of ice and dust grains that are just being ever so slightly accelerated ahead in their orbits, and they kind of leave behind a little bit of a gap. So you get this really cool twisted and braided structure that kind of smooths out as they get farther away from Prometheus. But then when Prometheus comes back around again, it regenerates a new set of waves. It's really quite beautiful and cool to, cool to look at. Now, the third method of maintaining rings, what I call replenishment, uh, is best exemplified by uh, Saturn's moon Enceladus. Enceladus is a snowball, and it's covered in water ice uh, and literally snow. And if you look, you'll see those beautiful geysers. Uh, these are called cryovolcanoes, or literally cold volcanism. And what's happening is we have internal heat that propels the water and lets it burst through the surface, resulting in these spectacular ice volcanoes and spraying water ice out into orbit around Saturn. These water ice particles then form Saturn's diffuse 
E-ring. Everything in Saturn's outermost ring should dissipate and disappear and spiral away from the planet, but Enceladus keeps replenishing this outer ring. Now, if you ever want to see Saturn in all its glory, I invite you just to marvel at this gorgeous image. This is the most spectacular image of Saturn uh, I think you'll ever see. The planet and the rings are backlit by the sun, and the diffuse outer rings are easily visible as well as the inner main rings. So if we zoom in on the outer E-ring, you can see Enceladus. If we pan across, you'll notice there are several moons uh, embedded or in between the ring systems. And now we see the main ring system uh, backlit. And you notice the light from sunlight being scattered from the rings onto the planet itself. So now we see the other edge of the ring system, and there are some more moons. And if you look down here, there's a blue pale dot that is not a moon, but rather is Earth. And if we zoom in on that particular image, we find there's not just the Earth, but also our moon. And this is just a beautiful look at home. So as we take a final look back at these rings, let's turn our attention to the other giant planets. First, let's take a cross-sectional view of all the rings. You'll notice that Jupiter is mostly a diffuse ring system. And that makes sense because when we look at Jupiter in our telescopes, we don't see the rings. They're very diffuse, and that's why I've had to really enhance them to give you some ideas to how they're structured. I've illustrated uh, its main ring here. And this ring was discovered by accident. It was discovered by the Voyager 1 spacecraft as it was flying past Jupiter in 1979. And as it was departing Jupiter and heading towards Saturn, it turned around and took an image. And while we got a good look at the atmosphere, we also discovered an unmistakable ring. This ring was later investigated in the 1990s by the Galileo spacecraft, and now we understand this ring to be being shepherded by Jupiter's four innermost moons. Uh, these are the moons that we don't see in our telescopes very easily. These are not the Galilean moons, but these are the four moons that orbit very close to Jupiter. So they maintain an inner uh, halo, which is like a giant donut of diffuse dust. There's the main ring that we can see from behind the planet. And then we have these two gossamer rings, which are even more diffuse. But the source of the dust that makes up the ring are really meteoroid impacts. These moons are very tiny. They don't have a whole lot of gravity. So the particles that are kicked up off the moons just enter into an orbit around Jupiter, and eventually they spiral inward and they fall in toward the planet. No problem, because there are always more meteoroids pelting away at these inner moons, kicking out more dust. So these rings are constantly being replenished. Uranus and Neptune have ring systems as well, and they're mainly composed of organics, or rather dark carbon-based materials, so they're really difficult to see. In fact, Uranus's rings were also discovered by accident by a team of astronomers in 1977. They were waiting for Uranus to pass in front of a star, but as the planet was approaching the star, there was a brief drop-off in starlight. Then the planet eclipsed the star, and then there was another drop-off in starlight. And the astronomers quickly understood that these, these leading and trailing drop-offs would be best explained by rings, five rings, in fact, producing these pre- and post-eclipse drop-offs. And when Voyager 2 flew past Uranus in 1986, it made images of the rings, but in order to see them, it had to take very long exposures, and that's why these images are so grainy and noisy. Nevertheless, it discovered two new rings and found that, for the most part, these rings are really darker than a lump of coal here is on Earth. The outer ring, dubbed Epsilon, is obviously the largest and relatively the brightest. Some of the chunks that make up this ring are as large as 100 kilometers across. And uh, there's, you know, it's a bit more reflective, which suggests the presence of some water ice amid the organics as well. Everything else is basically carbon-based compounds uh, comprising the remaining rings. Now, these rings are also maintained by shepherd moons. Uh, so here we have Ophelia and Cordelia. 
Uh, these two moons were discovered by Voyager 2 during its flyby in 1986. And additional rings have been discovered since then using the Hubble Space Telescope. So what we're looking at here is a composite image. Uh, the inner image of Uranus and its rings is basically a normal visible light image. And the outer gritty images are long 80 minute exposures. So we have a few features here. The first thing I'll point out are these uh, smears created by the motions of the moons. Uh, these are long exposures, the moons are moving, so you get these, you know, white smudges. But there's also a very clear uh, new ring that has been discovered. And although it's not obvious from this particular image, the astronomers detected a second inner ring as well. Not only that, but two new moons, Mab was discovered in this image and Cupid was discovered in a follow-up series of images. This is our present understanding of Uranus with 13 rings and 14 moons. Prior to Voyager 2's flyby in 1989, uh, astronomers had suspected that there were rings around Neptune as well. There were some observations that were not confirmed, but suggested that there could be some rings. And once Voyager 2 flew past, it quickly confirmed that yes, Neptune is surrounded by rings as well. However, these rings are clumped. At least one of the rings features these arcs, and there is a moon called Galatia that maintains these clumps or maintains the arcs. Observations by the Hubble Space Telescope uh, would watch the evolution and the change in the arcs and see if there are any new additional rings. And today we now have a family portrait of the Neptunian system that looks like this. So our current understanding is that Neptune has uh, at least five rings. Until recently, our conversation about rings would have ended here. Rings are features of the giant planets only. But they're not. Asteroids have rings. At least two asteroids are known that have rings. This is asteroid Carliclo. Uh, it's technically not an asteroid. Asteroids are objects that orbit in the inner solar system. This is something called a centaur, which is like an asteroid that orbits in the outer solar system. In any event, two rings were discovered surrounding this particular object, and it was discovered by accident because of a stellar occultation. You notice that there was a slight drop off in light from the star just before the asteroid passes in front of it. As the asteroid continues on, it departs, and then there's a second post occultation drop off, and it was this light curve that told the astronomers that they're dealing with rings. And so by tweaking the parameters and trying to figure out the orbit or the angle of the rings, they worked out uh, this sort of arrangement and figured that this is what's causing the observed drop off in light. Now that was the first time an asteroid has been shown to have rings, but that wasn't the only one. A second centaur called Chiron also has two rings. And a third object, which is now considered a dwarf planet, uh, this object is called Haumea. It has a ring, and it also has a very funny shape. Uh, it doesn't look like a planet, but the reason why it's so egg-shaped is because it rotates very rapidly. Uh, nevertheless, this ring system may not be very stable, but it will probably be here for another million years or so. So, can terrestrial planets have rings? The answer is, yeah. Uh, particularly Mars, and the reason why Mars is of interest is because Mars has not one but two moons. Now, Phobos and Deimos are long thought to be asteroids that were captured in orbit. However, it's possible that its largest moon, Phobos, uh, was actually created by an object slamming into Mars and perhaps this stuff collagulated together to form Phobos, uh, kind of like the way our own moon was formed. In any event, Mars would have had a ring after such a collision until Phobos forms, but Phobos's orbit is decaying. In other words, Phobos is coming closer and closer to Mars. So if Phobos is falling closer to Mars, then at some point it will pass inside of Mars's Roche limit and become tidally disrupted and transform back into a ring. So someday there could be a ring around Mars in perhaps as soon as 70 million years from now. And hopefully by that point we'll have people living on Mars 
to see this beautiful ring in the evening sky.